Okay, well, welcome back, and we'll get started reporting out on this. Um, keep everybody on. Okay, well, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Um, welcome back. So we'll um, get started on the last reporting out on the last paper. So um, we'll have uh, Rebecca start with the first question, which was like the previous ones: What is the state of implied treatment theory? So uh, our group talked a little bit about this and came up with that it was a compensatory strategy and it was really designed to uh, show how goals are managed and regulate the connection between kind of the goal and the broad executive function of being able to carry out that goal. Um, essentially, we had a little bit of an argument on this one um, in terms of because there were two studies in here, one of them was really thought to be sort of a template for a metacognitive study, where study two was really more of a case report. And then there was supposed to be sort of a theoretical tie because of the different delivery methods and different interventions. There was a real sort of dichotomy in the group between uh, what theory it was really based on. Is it, was it really totally grounded in theory or was um, with the different sort of scopes to this, was it really an articulated theory necessarily, or was it just a technique? So I think that was the tension. And just to add to that, that's sort of the, the spirit of our discussion as well, was the fact that there was sort of an implicit um, theory that this was under goal management training, which is really kind of a rubric of theories, but it wasn't uh, explicit about what exactly was the, the theory of the intervention, um, and that we sort of decided that it's, that it comes from the theory of kind of direct instruction for executive uh, dysfunction. Um. Can I just ask a question? I mean, clearly these are, uh, hardly any of these articles adequately articulate a theory, so we're always trying to dig out the implicit. but. But what's the object of treatment, as far as you could tell? In other words, you, you said executive function. But I mean, will executive function be better after this treatment? Or what will be better? I, I think, that, I mean, that's what we essentially saw, was the target was executive function. And I mean, I did see, we did talk about the fact that it is grounded somewhat in, depending on how you saw it, problem solving theory you know, in the 1971 sort of underpinnings, or they sort of reframe problem solving theory into goal management training as a technique. But I think the goal was for folks to be able to execute an executive strategy that was generalizable, at least from the first study. The second one, that's where the, the melding of the different techniques, they were both with the goal that they would improve a task by supporting the person's executive function, um, but in two very different techniques. Well, yeah, what I'm trying to get at really clearly is that Rebecca said it was viewed as a compensatory strategy. In general, if we're saying a compensatory strategy, like, do you think if we image the networks in the brain, they've been restored? Do you think that all standardized neuropsychological tests of executive function will be normal? So if, if not, then it can't really be executive function that's being the, t the object of treatment. It's, so what would it be? Yeah, I mean, I think that was another part of our discussion was the fact that um, if it is this uh, swaps-like or, you know, whichever the intervention is, whether it's this intervention or swaps, and it continues to be uh, stated over and over that this is sort of a, a, a compensatory aspect that you continue to have to stop each time and go through these steps and, and work that. If at some point it becomes automatic and it's actually internalized, then it would be more towards moving towards more of a restorative approach. This, this study didn't actually get at that, but what the potential for this line of literature might be is moving towards that way. Yeah. I mean, I think I just, I don't want to belabor this, but just because executive function even is broader than restoring this, right? I mean, it's social behavior. It's a whole bunch of things. So. I think it'd be probably more reasonable to frame this as something like accomplishment of a certain range of goal-directed tasks. So it's not going to necessarily eliminate socially inappropriate behavior, or energize you if you have no goals at all, blah, blah, blah. I would even argue that uh, it's, it's even more tighter than this, that 
uh, it's really a licitation of this five-step process at, in, at appropriate times that has been internalized, that's the object. Uh, and everything else, like social behavior, being able to resolve a problem, those are more, um, not necessarily distal, but m less proximal targets. Other thoughts? Okay. So in question two, and we'll start with Doug, um, what work is needed to move the research um, forward from this idea of concept um, and moving it forward? Well, I think we had two, two basic uh, things that we discussed. We, we talked about, and it gets back to your point, uh, John, that um, it's such a broad variety of different deficits that these uh, type of, of interventions could work on and that what we really needed to look at is, was more specifically what the deficits are and then targeting the intervention much more specifically to that. Uh, but the other thing was, you know, there was a large dosage problem in this. Um, we said that we spent more time talking about the paper than the patients in the study actually got in this intervention. Uh, so, uh, so there certainly was a dosage problem and I think, you know, Theo's swaps, uh, we, we talked about a much more uh, uh, intensive intervention over a period of time. Uh, might have uh, Im improved uh, the outcome. Uh, one of the things that we talked about was in terms of the outcome strategy to grow this research, that we needed a little bit more in the way of um, proximal outcomes if you're training to real life problems, um, so that um, you can have some sort of performance-based measures that are more ecologically valid and sort of demonstrate to the patient that they have a problem-solving strategy that works more proximally. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that we talked about quite a bit in this one was um, in terms of that they had explicated the, the steps to, and this is an earlier study, so we talked about how the field has moved forward in this particular area since, but in terms of how to manualize this standard treatment. So essentially they laid out the steps of how to train this and they sort of started the conversation and then since then, a number of people have made the attempt to manualize. So in terms of the translation aspect, we thought this was actually a nice way to start the conversation because it's how would you do this and then moving it towards the manualizing standard treatment. We also talked about even manualizing the standard of care in some ways. There are challenges talked about in other studies that have followed from this where even as you manualize the standard of care, um, that can become an intervention. So even if you manualize this intervention versus manualized standard of care, even if you're comparing those two manuals, it might move the field in terms of being able to compare a standard of care that's manualized versus others. Um, so those were the sort of, um, and the other thing that we talked about too was um, patient matching to the type of training. Because of the two different approaches, the two different studies that they reported on, um, one of the challenges that we saw was who is this an appropriate training for? Because really what they explicated was in a heterogeneous sample, you could do it one way. With somebody who's very amnestic, you might have to augment the training this way. So how do you take that manualized training and make it applicable to different patient populations? We thought that was another interesting point of the, the article. So uh, we came up with a few other points. We talked initially that the durability of any effects in this study were, were really not reported on. So obviously that's a big thing. Uh, we spent a lot of time discussing the need to optimize something like this and what that would look like. Um, and the real world impact was obviously something that needs to be shown for this and in specifically, you know, these simple tasks that may not translate into real life um, need to be shown to have some some effect. So some of the tasks, you know, grocery shopping might not apply to, you know, buying a house. We talked a lot about the kind of range of activities that people might, might need to do. Um, we did talk that identifying things like the premorbid factors that might actually influence people's initial ability to actually set a goal might be an important thing to look at. So looking at some of the behaviors or statuses they have in their job or their relationships might demonstrate their ability to actually be able to set goals and follow through on things would would allow for kind of a good analysis and be kind of a pre-surrogate for showing their ability to manage goal and then be able to show some effect. Um, 
we also thought that you know something like this is a good foundation but we need to show some criteria for a, per a person being able to successfully um, implement their strategy and apply it in real life so can they verbalize it can they apply it to something else and they might need to show that verbal ability to utilize it in the real world. So it seems like there was some agreement across groups, um, particularly on outcomes. Um, and looking at, we also had includes talking about a little bit of the inclusion exclusion criteria in our groups. Um, and the ecological validity of the outcomes and really, and that's come up as a theme across all of the groups um, as far as um, this piece um, and the outcome measures and the need for ecological validity and better outcome measures. Um, and then also the patient matching to the type of training. Who is this for and at what point in time? The other piece that came out was when, when do you do this and at what point? Um, and again, this has also come out across studies. and what to target um, and looking at dosage. So again, similar issues coming up. So other points, other, other comments? Brian and Axe, but I, I just thought that uh, the point that you made about uh, the amnestic person maybe needing another thing was, was interesting and connects back to the thing that we talked about yesterday that you know, to some, sometimes it might seem sort of laborious to focus so much on what really are we treating. But if you take Theo's perspective that in fact, the, thing, the direct thing we want is for people to acquire the ability to do this strategy, right? I mean, if you just say the first thing they have to do is learn how to do, go through these steps, and now the inclusion criteria, if you will, have to be that you can remember that unless you have another treatment. So now as you want to broaden to people who don't have memory, that is that sort of enablement thing where the complexities and now I have a person who has memory problems and goal problems, what's the supportive treatment for the memory that interferes with even acquiring this strategy, right? Well, that's what we were talking about, the range of tasks that you might be able to use that for and the valence for the patient may make a huge difference in terms of, you know, this was something that the patient presented with as a problem. Um, and so there were multiple techniques used with the same overarching strategy. Um, and I think we see that in a lot of our patients, but to the extent that you can manualize any parts of those to use them in conjoint or to have a technique that underlies that you can remediate to extend your strategy, you know, um, you know, what about people who you can't use? They need visual cues, but they have significant visual field neglect. I mean, you know, you can have some tips and tricks that go with a manual um, that, you know, would it be able to extend it a bit and give you the flexibility that you need? We'll start with Allison for question three. What aspect of this treatment um, showed promise, if any? This every time. Um, I apparently need to learn the difference between the buttons. Um, so um, I'll practice that. Um, so one of the things that we saw was that it's very straightforward. It was a very straightforward, very straightforward schematic in the first study, really easily translatable, very achievable, um, that it was repeatable across situations. So it had a little bit more of a generalizability to it. It wasn't specific to a certain type of communication or a certain type of visual training, that it had a little bit more of a broad swath. Um, and that you know, really that this has grown in the literature to be similar interventions that are called a number of different things. Um, but what, um, what we also ta thought too was some of them, at least the second one, it tied an outcome that was meaningful to the patient. So that the training was tied to an outcome that was thought to have significant valence. Um, the, the sort of, I guess some of these are weaknesses, so I don't know if I'm talking about weaknesses here because we said what shows promise. Um, but the other thing was it was manualizable. Um, but it also gave you divergent directions, so ways that you could either expand or contract the level of the therapy or the, the way that the therapy was implemented depending on the severity of the patient. Um, so we thought that that also showed promise because it showed flexibility and approach. So we picked up on some of the same themes um, 
that the treatment itself was relatively short and not very resource intense. So maybe to take this to another another layer where you know you would increase the dosage and maybe periodically assess the effects seems like something that would naturally occur after this. And something um, that just has one session that shows some value, maybe something that um, you know can be picked up on really easily and translated. So in addition to some of the things that you all both discussed, um, our, our team talked a little bit more about uh, the charge, the specific charge, and that's application to military settings. And we felt that um, military settings, uh, goal management sort of training is very practical for. It actually fits in with the sort of training. And as you know, that's very important in terms of getting the, pairing the intervention to the, to the population that, that wants it. And if they're used to this sort of level of training, breaking down tasks, making it very specific, that's something that, uh, that we thought had a lot of potential. Um, you know, checklists, uh, breaking tasks down is, is very commonly used in military training aspects. So it's not going to be foreign to, to them. Um, the other thing that we talked about and it sort of alluded to is uh, that we felt that, it, that as long as uh, the therapist used the uh, sort of a, a functional approach looking at things, it can be, th this type of technique could be adapted in multiple ways. And we talked about the difference between, let's say, um, working in a school setting where you have somebody, let's say, a student with a, a milder or mo moderate injury that has very specific tasks. You could work on a couple of things related to academic functioning and send them on their way versus something more intensive like the SWAPS program or something that would be, uh, uh, you'd want to try and help somebody to, to make this uh, much more uh, naturalized. So anyway. Other thoughts? Okay. So um, basically, again, coming up with manualization as a strength and, um, and flexibility across populations, potentially also across um, issues with the patient and flexibility across settings, um, and particularly the issue of it being very rele um, relevant to the military setting um, uh, coming out. And so how can this uh, treatment inform studies of other different domains or treatment types? And we'll start with Rebecca. Sorry. So we had uh, quite a broad discussion about this, and it kind of interwove with some of our other questioning, but we thought that a treatment like this might be something that uh, you could look at the broader picture and start to identify some criteria or ways to optimize or, or ways to look at optimization of the specific treatment type and, and move it forward. We talked about the many options and many ways there's to optimize and uh, how there's really not a, a specific set of guidelines of how that happens and how we order it, and it's often driven by practicality, and that a, a situation like this, um, you kind of need to show that to some degree it works and begin the funding there and, and then bring the optimization piece. Um, but we talked a lot about at what point is kind of a nascent study like this sort of good enough to optimize, and we said that you know you would need to show things like usability in any sort of broad generalized uh, application that was kind of a theme that came up but that something like this uh, demonstrate that there's a potential for some future qualitative research um, and i think that's that hits on some things if i miss something somebody correct me Allison. Um, one of the things that we thought was particularly promising was, um, or how it could be informed, is that the active ingredients in this might differ, but it's really um, the way that they structured it is, um, take that back, if, if they had memory or other deficits, the active ingredients could differ, right? So that the active ingredient could be the executive, but as you start layering things on, some of those active ingredients may change depending on how flexible you made it. Um, but the good thing was that it was a technique that someone could have available and use as needed. So it was potentially generalizable, um, which we thought was a key point for some of these, that it was a strategy um, generation. The other thing that was brought up in our discussion was, especially with respect to the case report, was the inclusion and exclusion criteria of therapeutic treatment, pharmacotherapeutic treatment. So ensuring that people are stable on, on other therapeutics that might affect cognition 
potentially affect the outcome of the study. Um, it was particularly noted in the case report. Um, the other thing that we noted um, was that, uh, what was the other thing that was promising on this was essentially that, that pointing out of the differential between how flexible the training could be um, so that it gave you that patient match to treatment approach so that you had somebody with severe amnestic disorder that it could be used with and then you had a heterogeneous sample of TBI patients. And so it gave you some promise that you had particular patient populations that could benefit from it, but you need to do more studies with different inclusion and exclusion criteria to see how you would have to implement it in that way, but that you had a basic approach. Um, and this really sort of goes into some of the stuff that we talked about with five too. Um, we kind of went between four and five a little bit. So uh, in the interest of getting to the next question, I'll save it for five. You can keep going. <clears throat> uh, our group needed a little goal management training because we didn't really get much to four. Uh, but uh, what we did speak about, and, and, that they, and you sort of just alluded to it, is the fact that we felt like the interventions were very different in study one and study two. It was almost like two separate, uh, I mean, they threw it again under the rubric of goal management training, but it really wasn't. It was two totally different things, checklist based. Um, and so, uh, anyway, that's all we got to. Yes, and our group had a, had a large discussion on that and actually had some disagreement on whether or not that it was actually the same intervention or not. So, um, and we did not come to consensus. I will definitely say that that, that occurred in our group as well. And so the last question um, on this particular piece, what characteristics or conclusions from the example study are relevant for the larger picture? And we'll start with Doug on that one. Um, we we kind of talked a little bit about um, issues with related, uh, with respect to outcomes on this particular uh, one. You know, it, in this particular study, um, the outcomes were part of the training. They were training to the outcome, uh, which may have some in very specific populations and very specific behaviors, there may be some uh, some utility to that. We talked about you know like teaching someone survival skills or some some basic sort of skill. But that what was really missing that we really needed to do is to move more into uh, you know what generalizable, what kind of functional relevance, what what kind of outcomes uh, would be important in that way. Um, and then we talked a little bit more about. Uh, the issue about treatment dose and that um, that if you really are trying to build this as a skill or make it more of a restorative technique or something else that the dosage you know has to be increased significantly so we touched on some of those themes but one of the things that did come up was that executive function is a very broad term and actually targeting specific specifically executive function is is really kind of an a difficult area and so ascribing outcomes would be fairly challenging and because we had a lot of discussion about what are they actually assessing and what are the treating versus uh, what is the technique versus the theory which I think we've already touched on um, we did talk that it's relatively simple and it could be implemented for very simple tasks and specifically for a military population of how to get to the store how to clean yourself um, very very quickly could be implemented. Um, we had sort of a I'm okay, you're okay discussion here a little bit, which was um, kind of being charitable, but in some ways there were people at the table who said you need to stop being so hard on your own literature. Um, that there's value to case reports, that there's value to some of these smaller studies um, where you can sort of test out those ideas and see them as signals. Um, and so uh, after we hugged, um, we uh, moved on to some other things that we thought were, were also relevant in terms of it's an interesting way to do a pilot in terms of, you know, there are recruitment issues in our field. I mean, we don't get these very homogeneous patient populations. And so you have problems and sometimes generalizing some of this because of your effect sizes, because of the power that you have, because of practical issues that patients with disabilities face, transportation to get to the trial, um, lack of access. And so one of the things that we also talked about was, wouldn't it be great if you could do some of these things in multi-site networks, you know, where you really optimize um, 
the ability, the power of a group of, of folks doing small samples, which you could do within DOD or within VA or within NIH or, or and, and I, uh, the NITER, you know, so that you optimize the power of the network itself to get these small things done, and it encourages standardization, and it encourages the generalizability piece, because you can do these very small things and make them more powerful and allow for the statistical techniques like nesting of site, you know, so that you'd get some of those pieces where you might not get it in these small promising studies. Um, but that moving that, you have to be a little bit more charitable. The other thing that we talked about too here was that the variability um, between patients also changes you a little bit with respect to clinical trials because some of the things that they're doing in clinical trials now in terms of uh, meaningful, meaningful clinical differences or reliable change. Uh, one, we're limited by our outcome measures because some of them, if they really capture a functional outcome, they have less reliability. So it makes it harder to show those differences that would exceed those sort of statistical uh, tests. But the other piece is because of the variability um, that you have some difficulties with your outcomes. So if you want to do meaningful outcomes, it, it may really affect the effect that you can get from that therapy. So we had this really wide-ranging discussion in this, more on the methodology and how you could make this happen um, and how you can increase the power of some of these smaller efforts to make them a little bit more broadly applicable. You know, another consideration with these compensatory strategies is that they can actually be thought of as, as products, and, and there might be some good reasons to do that. You know, one is that if you think of it as a product, it, it, it requires you not only to test efficacy, but also usability and acceptability, you know, will people actually use it? Uh, it also invites you to think about how it's presented. So, I mean, is this, a, is this technique on a card? Is it a notebook? Is it a phone app? You know, what's, again, going to be most acceptable and, and most useful? Uh, and finally, it, it, perhaps most importantly, it opens up a whole other funding stream in the civilian world in terms of SBI or STTR types of, of grants. Yeah, and you know, Jim, that's a really interesting point because if you look at like the psychological health literature and some of the things, for example, DOD and VA have done with um, PTSD treatment, right? So yeah. they really, you know, they released the PE coach, right? So it yeah. took the homework piece of the therapy and the recording and all of that, put it on, not this kind of phone, obviously, yeah. um, but a smartphone. You know, and so everything is within that device. Now, the challenge to that is, I mean, the other piece of that, honestly, is then the device piece. So then you get into regulatory waters that may make it a little bit more difficult, but, because um, FDA is starting to look at that. But I think that that is sort of the wave of the future. There are so many ways that we can enable some of these techniques through technology that we didn't have before, that I think that's a huge point, that you can standardize some of the homework, some of the cues, some of the ways that you do things without having to involve the clinician and really move the field forward from that perspective and give the patient some self-help strategies that are in their pocket that they can pull out at any time to review as they'd like to and gives them a little bit more control, motivation, and, and enhances the experience. And, you know, it also opens up some interesting data collection possibilities. You know, you could see, you know, with their permission, see if how many, many times people actually use this, you know, by having them upload it to the web. You know? Well, the P, like the PE coach, VA's just gotten permission to take the data with the patient's permission, and it goes directly into the chart. So it actually informs the clinician when they did their homework, what they did in their homework, so you can review it before the patient even comes in, because it's going to port directly into the medical record. Yeah. So there are technologies that we could utilize that are within our systems, that are within reach. I mean, granted, that was a two-year process to get the IT piece of that approved, but <laughs> I mean, it's doable. It is doable. And, um, the other thing we talked about in terms of co compensatory strategies specifically is to recommend that people think separately about evaluating the acquisition of the strategy and uh, the impact of using the strategy on the target domain. Because 
if you just go straight to the ladder, you don't know when you fail whether it's because they're using it all the time and it was badly designed strategy that doesn't solve the problem or they didn't really acquire it, in which case you would load more training or think about user friendliness or so very different uh, solutions depending on where the failure occurred. I actually have the one other point that we had at this one too. We did have a discussion too about just the training of people in the field of cognitive rehabilitation in terms of their clinical trial expertise. Um, that it's not sort of inborn to our training programs, to our fellowships, it's not how necessarily we train. Um, and that one of the things that we may want to think about too is how do we work with our training programs um, to get some of those skills that would enable us, you know, we talk about all the time, what's our value added? What's our return on investment? How do we do things where we show what the value is? And clinical trials do that. But if we don't train the people who know how to do it and are doing the research, how to do those clinical trials, and we'll enhance their fellowships or their training experiences in some way, we're still going to be lagging. And so that's another piece of it that we talked about. So did you all have other issues that came up um, in your groups that um, similar to what happened in our group that you want to talk about? Uh, I'll, I'll bring up one point that came up that I don't know if we had an um, answer to, but we talked about why aren't things moving through the research pipeline as maybe efficiently and effectively that we think about. And we talked about how investigators are really somewhat siloed and are interested in what they're interested in. And they're maybe not the best at optimizing a specific treatment or implementing it at a later stage, and that really their specialty can sometimes dictate their own research agenda. And obviously, funding issue plays a lot into this as well. And we ha kind of had a short little discussion about that. The only thing I just wanted to add was that <clears throat> we talked about the fact that this is a very practical intervention, that it's manualizable, that it's adaptable, it has all these positives. And then we talked about the fact that this is coming from the no treatment uh, uh, you know, realm. And so, you know, one of the things that we kind of discussed is that probably because of the heterogeneity of this, uh, of the conditions of, of trying to ha how to apply it, that it, that was very hard. Um, and Mary, there you are, was talking about the fact that there's potentially some, some key ingredients that, um, that uh, direct training is sort of a key ingredient, kind of gets at your point too about uh, making sure first that they have the intervention, that they, they know it before you look at sort of application of those things. But um, despite the fact that we talked about how uh, that this should move forward, that there's a lot of uh, lines of research in this area, it still came from uh, kind of the no evidence pile. Which again follows up on the themes from um, yesterday about the multiple time points of evaluation, and that's really critical in designing, designing effective um, uh, studies to be able to do that, to see where, where we're, um, particularly in the beginning phases of um, evaluating treatment strategies to really integrate that. Other, other comments, questions on this particular um, part of it? Okay, well, I'll turn it over to John. Thank you all very much for your work.